Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining our activity for today. Ito po ay ating Vivox Talk Series na ating ginagawa bilang pagdiriwa ng ating National Science and Technology Week. Kahapon po ay ating pinag-usapan ang volcano monitoring of the active volcanoes in the Philippines. Kung ito po ay inyong namis, pagkatapos po nitong ating programa, ay maaari po tayong pumunta sa aming Facebook page at panoorin ang recorded video. Sa ngayon naman po, ating pag-uusapan ang searching for the big one. Hindi po the one ha, kaya iset aside muna natin ang usapang pag-ibig and let us have a mutual understanding about the earthquake scenarios in the Philippines. I am Melissa Mitamayo and I will be your MC for today. Para maging maayos po ang takbo ng ating programa, ay narito po ang ilang paalala. Kindly check in through chat or ang aming comment section sa Facebook with your affiliation, either your office or school, and your full name. Kung kayo naman po ay nanonood via Zoom, we encourage you to rename using the same format and make sure po na nakasara ang ating camera at pati ang ating microphone para hindi ma-distract ang ating speakers, gayon na rin po ang mga nanonood. Tandaan na ito pong activity ay recorded at live stream via Facebook ng DOST Fivox and NSDW. Ang inyo pong pakikilahok ay importante sa amin. Kaya huwag pong kalimutan na sagutan ng ating attendance form. Ang link ay ilalagay ng ating sekretaryat sa chat box o kaya naman ay comment section. Siguraduhin po na tama ang inyong active email at pati na rin ang inyong pangalan na ilalagay sa e-certificate at ang ating information materials ay ipapadala sa inyo after ng ating 3-day activity. And with that, I would like to call the DOST Undersecretary and FIVOX Officer in Charge, Dr. Renato Celedium Jr. to welcome you all. Sir? Magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat at salamat po sa inyong uh, pagdalo dito sa pangalawang uh, talk sa talk series na ginagawa ng DOST FIVOX uh, in celebration of the National Science and Technology Week. Ito pong uh, National Science and Technology Week ay pinagdiriwang ng kakaiba ngayong 2021. Maliban sa ito'y virtual na pangalawang taon na virtual na tayo, nag-decide po ang DOST management na gawing truly national ang National Science and Technology Week celebration. Ibig pong sabihin, kahit po sinong organization outside of DOST ay pwedeng uh, magkaroon uh, ng kanyang activity Uh, tulad po ng mga webinar, mga virtual tour, mga uh, pakulo, mga quiz, at iba pa, mga awarding related to science and technology. Upang talagang truly ay magkaroon talaga ng national scope uh, in terms of participation, ang iba't ibang sektor ng lipunan, uh, government, higher education institutes, no? mga DepEd schools division, pati private sector, mga industry, ay pwedeng sumali. Kaya po kami nagpapasalamat ng lubos sa inyo sa uh, pagdalo. Hindi lang dito sa FIVOX Talk Series, pati na rin sa iba pang mga activities sa National Science and Technology Week na makikita nyo po ang mga activities sa website ng DOST, nstw.dost.gov.ph. Ito pong araw na to ay uh, tatalakay natin ang tinatawag na The Big One. Ang salitang big one ay hindi po talaga patungkol sa isang prediction ng isang lindol at hindi lang para sa isang lugar yan, kundi ito ay ginagamit na phrase no o kataga para maipaliwanag sa mga tao na bawat lugar, bawat syudad, bawat probinsya o rehiyon ay pwedeng maapektuhan ng isang uh, malakas na lindol. At kadalasan ang big one ay ito yung pinaka-worst case scenario na dapat nating paghandaan upang tayo ay hindi masyadong maapektuhan. Ang aking uh, ginagamit parati na analogy pagdating sa preparedness, pagdating ng lindol, ay sa larangan ng sports na boxing. Uh, may iba-ibang uh, weight category. No? Uh, ang ang uh, divisions ng boxing, uh, meron mga mal- magagaan lamang, tulad ng lightweight or flyweight hanggang uh, masyadong mabigat tulad ng heavyweight. 
At ang mga disasters na pwedeng mangyari ay pwedeng maimbing sa kategory ng mga boxing divisions. Kung ang lindol mo ay hindi masyadong malakas, yung kahandaan mo na normal lang ay pwede na. Pero kung ang lindol na mangyari ay unang-una napakatindi, mataas ang magnitude. Pangalawa, ang konteksto ng ating mga lugar ay masyadong urban, maraming tao, maraming bahay. Siyempre, mas maraming exposed sa panganib dulot ng lindol, mas marami ang posibleng mamatay o masugatan o di kaya mga businesses na maapektuhan. So ang the big one sa lindol ay earthquake scenario na pwede nating maranasan uh, yung pinakamatindi at kung wala tayong gagawin ay eh baka mangyari yun. Of course, nauso dito sa kamay nilaan yung salitang the big one patungkol sa isang earthquake scenario na pwedeng uh, lindol na manggagaling sa West Valley Fault at dahil nandito na rin ito sa eastern side ng Metro Manila at karating na probinsya, ay siya na rin ang lindol na magpapauga sa Metro Manila ng malakas at makakaapekto sa mga tao, mga building, mga bahay ng matindi sa Metro Manila at karating na probinsya. Pero gusto ko pong linawin na ang ganong senaryo ay para lang sa Metro Manila and the areas around it. Ang ating bawat bayan, bawat syudad, bawat probinsya o rehiyon ay mas may sariling big one. So, dapat po na maintindihan po natin ito at dito po sa susunod na uh, talk series, ito pong bibigay ni Mr. Perez, uh, Jeffrey Perez, ay magpapaliwanag sa inyo ng iba't ibang earthquake scenarios or the big one scenarios sa iba't ibang lugar sa Pilipinas. Mas angkop ang, ang senaryo, mas tama ang information for your area, dapat yung ating preparedness and response. No? Uh, pwede po nating ma-anticipate yung dapat na response natin. Uh, ay angkop po, po doon sa bibigay na earthquake senaryo. So, Makinig po kayo mabuti, magtanong po kayo, and most importantly, after you've learned something out of this presentation, gamitin po natin ito ng tama sa paghahanda nating sarili, ng ating pamilya, ng ating komunidad, ng ating mga organizations or mga schools, so that we all no, are prepared appropriately. Importante po yung earthquake scenario. Tama pong kaalaman ng bawat isa pareho para ang ating mga gagawing preparedness and responses are also appropriate and aligned with its other. May pang national, may pang local, may pang familia. So with that, um, again, uh, please uh, learn a lot from the speaker and uh, apply this later on. Maraming salamat po sa inyo lahat. Thank you very much, sir, for that reminder. Kaya nga po nang sinabi ni Yusek Solidum, dapat po ay mapaghandaan natin ang lindol ng appropriately. Pero hindi natin alam kung kailan ito darating. Kaya dapat po maintindihan natin ano nga po ba yung ating mga dapat na paghandaan para maging maayos yung ating magiging preparedness pagdating sa lindol. Para sabihin sa atin yan, ay narito ang Supervising Science Research Specialist and 2017 NAS Outstanding Young Scientist, Mr. Jeffrey Perez. Sir Jeff? Good, after, uh, good morning. Isang makaagham na umaga sa ating lahat. Uh, maraming salamat sa pagsama niyo sa amin sa ating isasagawang webinar. And uh, for this uh, topic, we will uh, focus on the different big ones, katulad ng sinabi ni Yusek Solidum. Missy, nakikita na ba yung presentation ko? Yes, sir. Okay, so uli, ma mag magandang umaga at happy National Science and Technology Weeks sa ating lahat. Um, binabati rin natin yung mga kasama natin sa, sa Facebook Live. And sana i-share natin ito para mas marami yung makaalam. So for this presentation, ang ating objective ay maintindihan natin kung ano ba yung science behind the earthquake scenarios in the Philippines. Kailangan malaman natin na yung big one ay hindi lamang nasa Metro Manila, maaaring magkaroon ng big one sa bawat region, bawat probinsya at bawat syudad sa buong Pilipinas. 
So, kailangan nating malaman to, kailangan natin makita yung science behind this and paano natin to i-apply sa kanya-kanya nating communities. As we all know, the Philippines is a seismically active region. Malamang nakita niyo na itong mga itong itong image na to, yung nasa kanan pinapakita niya yung mga lindol sa Pilipinas, isang tuldok, isang lindol. This is a record of our uh, seismicity for the past 100 years. So makikita natin na sa bawat lugar sa Pilipinas ay may red dots maliban sa Palawan and araw-araw nagkakaroon tayo ng mga lindol. Ang average na nare-record ng FIVOX ay at least 20 earthquakes per day. May mga panahon na kung nagkakaroon ng isang malakas na lindol, may mga aftershocks, kung, kung merong mga earthquake swarms, kung minsan nakaka-record ang FIVOX ng mahigit isang daang lindol sa isang araw. So itong mga lindol na to ay hindi naman lahat nararamdaman ng tao. Mas marami yung hindi nararamdaman. For the, uh, ang average natin sa isang taon ay at least mga 100 to 150 felt events per year. Pero ang kailangan nating malaman is that for the past 400 years, mahigit isang daang mga destructive earthquakes na ang nangyari sa iba't ibang lugar sa Pilipinas. Sa Metro Manila, mahigit sampung destructive earthquakes. Sa Mindanao, mahigit sampu rin. Tumatama siya ng mga benteng mga destructive earthquakes. And itong mga destructive earthquakes na to, hindi natin alam sa ating generation. Maaring nangyari to during the Spanish time. Maaring nangyari to nung kalulu yung mga lolo natin sa tuhod. So, ang makikita natin dito is itong mga destructive earthquakes na to, Pwede natin lagyan ng question mark, ito na ba yung big one na nangyari sa amin, sa lugar namin? Maaring yun, pero maaring hindi rin. So kailangan natin pag-aralan, ano ba talaga yung big one na pwedeng mangyari sa aming lugar? Bakit may lindol sa Pilipinas? Ang simpleng sagot, because the Philippines is part of the Pacific Ring of Fire. Dahil sa ating geographic and tectonic location, Marami tayong mga sources ng earthquakes. Yung sources ng earthquakes, pwede natin siyang i-divide into two categories. Yung mga nasa dagat na sources, we call this as the trenches. Ito yung mga boundaries ng tinatawag nating mga tectonic plates. So yung Pilipinas, kung makikita natin on your, uh, on your left na figure, merong mga white lines. Itong mga white lines ay yung mga trenches. Nasa dagat to. Itong mga trenches na to ay maaring magkaroon ng malakas na lindol, maaring mag-generate sila ng mga lindol ng higit magnitude 8, and hindi lang lindol yung pwede niyang i-generate, pwede rin siyang mag-generate ng tsunami. So makikita natin na sa paligid ng Pilipinas, we have the Manila Trench, Negro Sulu Trench, Cotabato Trench, Philippine Trench, and the East Luzon Trench. Yung isang kategory ng earthquake generators sa Pilipinas ay yung mga active faults. Ito yung makikita natin yung mga red lines. And itong mga red lines na to, active faults, pwede rin siyang mag-generate ng earthquake. Maaring nag-generate na siya ng malakas na lindol in the past. Pero may posibilidad na may, maaring magkaroon ulit sila ng paggalaw sa mga future generations o sa, sa future na nabuhay natin. So maaring yung, yung fault na yan, nagkaroon na siya ng big one in the past, pero maaring maulit yung mga big ones na to. So kailangan natin makita gaano ba, paano nalalaman ng FIVOX na yung fault na to ay mag-generate na isang malakas sa lindol. Yung trench na to, bak, paano nalalaman ng FIVOX na ganito kalaki yung, kanila, yung pwede niyang i-generate. So yun yung pag-aaralan natin. So what are earthquake scenarios? So kailangan natin i-define muna. First, alam natin yung definition ng earthquake. Yung earthquake is yung paggalaw ng lupa generated by active faults and trenches. Eh ano naman yung scenario? Ang scenario ay para lang nanonood tayo ng movie, nanonood tayo ng K-drama, di ba? May mga scenes, may mga scenario sa sa pinanonood nating mga K-drama. So 
it's just a suggested or assumed sequence or development of events. Diba? Kung sa, sa ating pangkaraniwang buhay, nanonood tayo ng, 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 ng television, ng, ng movies, we have this storyboard, may mga scripts, may mga sequences. So ito yung tinatawag nating scenario. It could be scenario ng isang, uh, inang, inang isang weather. And then kapag masyadong complicated, we can have some scenario flowchart. So tatandaan natin, scenario is just a sequence or development of events. Sequence and then the development. Importante yon yung development of events kasi ibig sabihin merong mga, may mga hakbang para mabuo ang isang scenario. So kung pagsasamahin natin yung earthquake and scenario, kailangan nating tignan din ano ba ang isang effective na senaryo? Ang isang effective na senaryo ay first, kailangan realistic. It should be science-based. So meron tayong mga basehan para gawin natin itong senaryo na to. Science-based can actually occur, mangyayari siya talaga, and then close to the reality. So ito yung isang characteristics ng isang effective senaryo. Next, Specific. Kailangan yung senaryo natin, meron siyang location, at kung kakayanin ay merong time constraint. Kailan mangyayari kung kaya natin? Di ba? Kung kaya natin gawin yon Science-based, meron siyang specific location, and then locally relevant. Ibig sabihin, yung gagawin nating senaryo ay makakatulong sa isang local situation. So in the case of the Philippines, Ito bang senaryo na gagawin natin ay makakatulong sa paghahanda ng isang community. Okay? So pagsasamahin natin ngayon yung earthquake at senaryo and ang definition natin is that ang earthquake scenario is an assumed hazard scenario describing the estimated ground shaking potential or yung intensity, its potential hazards and impacts that can be caused by a specific earthquake. So Ang ibig sabihin nito, yung gagawin nating earthquake scenario, just like yung makikita natin on your right, this is a ground shaking scenario for a magnitude 7.2 earthquake along the West Valley Fault. Makikita natin yung estimated ground shaking, which is um, uh, identified by the colored uh, polygons. Yung orange is an intensity 8. Its potential hazards. And then yung impacts niya, impacts niya sa airport, impacts niya sa seaport, impacts niya sa kalsada, impact niya sa mga tao. And uh, at a specific earthquake scenario, yung specific earthquake scenario is the magnitude 7.2 along the West Valley Fault. So earthquake scenario can be used as a planning tool to understand a potential future earthquake dahil sa meron tayong uh, naiisip na scenario, we can plan accordingly and we can take appropriate steps. So that's the definition of an earthquake scenario. So how does the OST FIVOX generate earthquake scenarios? Paano ba ginagawa ito ng DOST FIVOX? Tandaan natin, it should be science-based. So the next slide will show you a, a, system, a, a, a simple framework on how we do earthquake scenarios. First, we identify the magnitude of the earthquake. Yung magnitude, it should be the maximum credible earthquake. Ano ba yung pinakamalakas na pwedeng i-generate nitong isang active faults na to o isang trench na to? It is calculated based on fault length, yung haba ng fault. Malalaman natin yung magnitude ng earthquake na pwede niyang i-generate. Does this fault length can be determined by the seismicity, yung mga mapa natin, satellite images, and field studies. In, in our earthquake scenarios, we also consider the local soil conditions. And these lo local soil conditions are characterized through geophysical, geotechnical, and field studies. So simplihan natin. Alam natin na merong fault na malapit sa inyong lugar. Kino consider natin din yung lupa or yung subsurface dun sa ilalim ninyo. Ang general rule natin is that 
kapag kayo ay naka nakapuesto or ang lugar ninyo ay nasa isang lugar na malambot, ito yung mga lugar na malapit sa dagat, malapit sa ilog, reclaimed areas, swampy areas, mangrove areas, malalambot itong mga lugar na to. Ang ang automatic niyan pag malambot, mas malakas yung pwedeng ground shaking compared sa isang lugar na ang nasa ilalim niya ay mga matitigas na mga bato. So, merong difference yun. Dinadagdagan din natin yung earthquake scenarios natin ng recurrence interval. Ang ibig sabihin ng recurrence interval, ano ba yung, pa yung estimated repeatedness of this large magnitude earthquake? Na kailan pwedeng maulit? Hindi tayo ng hula, pero nagkakaroon tayo ng idea kung paano umuulit yung isang malakas na lindol. Nalalaman ito sa pamamagitan ng mga pag-aaral ng mga historical earthquakes. And we go beyond the historical earthquakes, we also do paleoseismic studies. And meron ding mga grupo ng mga scientists sa FIVOX na ang inaaral nila ay yung current baka nag distortion ng energy, baka magkaroon siya ng malakas na paggalaw in the future. And then, we have the seismic hazard scenarios and extent of impacts are modeled using simulations and fragility curves. So, itong seismic hazard scenarios can be, um, um, can be simulated using uh, our self, uh, self-owned na mga softwares. Mamaya makikita nyo, ano yung mga softwares na pwede nating mag mag magamit para magkaroon tayo ng mga seismic hazard scenarios. So yung 1, 2, 3, yung first top 3, ito yung i-input natin para magkaroon tayo ng seismic hazard scenarios based on the simulations na gagawin ng ating mga softwares. So important data in generating earthquake scenarios is the trace of the fault. Kailangan alam natin kung nasaan yung earthquake sources Nasaan ba yung fault? Nasaan ba yung trenches? Yung fault, yung active fault, the fault length vary from tens to thousands of kilometers. It may extend hundreds of kilometers. Sa trenches natin, it may extend thousands of kilometers. Pwedeng magkaroon ng ganong scenario. And ang general rule is that the longer the fault, the higher the magnitude it can be. So, Mas mahaba yung fault na makikita natin sa isang lugar. Mas mahabang fault or trench yung, ma yung malapit sa inyo. Maaring or the higher the magnitude it can be. So magbibigay tayo na example. For example, ang pinakamahabang fault sa Pilipinas ay yung tinatawag na Philippine fault. The Philippine fault is a left lateral strike slip fault. And ang haba ng fault na to ay more than 1,200 kilometers. It will extend from northern Luzon, yung makikita niyong black line sa gitna ng, ng, met, ng, ng Philippines. So from northern Luzon, tatawid siya dito sa may Infanta Quezon, going to Ginyangan, Ginayangan Quezon, passing through the Boreas, Tikaw Island, Masbate Island, on the eastern side of Masbate Island, then, ikakat niya yung Leyte Island, and then it will enter in San Francisco, Surigao del Norte, and then tatawirin niya yung Eastern Mindanao sa may Agusan Marsh, going to Davao Oriental, and mag -e exit siya sa may Mati Davao Oriental. So that's 1,250 kilometers. Based on the GPS, yung Global Positioning Slip Rates, uh, ang computation is this fault, gumagalaw siya ng 1.5 to 3.6 centimeters per year. And based sa mga studies na ginawa, napag-alaman na this Philippine fault has already ruptured and there is historical surface rupture. Pag sinabi natin historical, uh, ang basis natin dito ay yung mga past earthquakes na na-document ng mga Spanish priests. So mula 1500s hanggang 1800s kung saan nan under tayo ng, Sp ng Spanish government, uh, yung, mga, yung mga pare, yung mga priests during that time, they have documented 
devastating earthquakes in the Philippines and some of their documentation, um, makoconclude natin na nagkaroon ng surface rupture. Along the Philippine fault, makikita natin yung mga circles here. These circles are epicenters of earthquakes along the Philippine fault. And some of these uh, epicenters, nagkaroon siya ng surface rupture. Merong magnitude 7.8, 1990. Pinakamalaki yung magnitude 7.9, the 1645 event. Mamaya, i-discuss natin yan. Yung 1880, magnitude 7.6 sa may Infanta Quezon. Sa, uh, sa may Davao de Oro area, merong magnitude 7.3 na earthquake. Diyan sa lugar rin yun, noong 1893. So marami ng mga epicenters na nangyari. Ang mahalaga dito, katulad ng sinabi ko sa inyo kanina, the longer the fault, the higher the magnitude. Dahil sa characteristics ng Philippine fault, kinoconsider natin yung Philippine fault is segmented. Gumagalaw yung Philippine fault segments by segments. Hindi gagalaw ang Philippine fault ng 1,200 kilometers. Hindi yan gagalaw. Kasi pag yan ay gumalaw, that will be a magnitude 8 plus na lindot. Pero napag-alaman ng mga scientists natin that this fault is moving segments by segments. And on recent years, merong paggalaw. Katulad nung 2017, 2017, yung Surigao segment, yung Northern Surigao segment, gumalaw siya ng 2017. And it ruptured dito sa, uh, sa may Anawawan, sa Anawawan Bridge, sa may San Francisco, Surigao del Norte, and nasira yung bridge. That was a magnitude 6.7. Uh, six months after, nagkaroon ng earthquake sa may Leyte, it also ruptured this fault. Okay? Itong fault na to, ito naman yung Leyte segment ng Philippine fault. And in 2020, last year, nagkaroon din ng movement ng fault sa may Masbate with a magnitude of 6.5. So, alam natin that this fault is segmented. Next, in Mindanao, we have already also uh, established yung mga segments ng faults. Itong mga faults na to may, may extend from 50 kilometers, 20 kilometers, and the longest is 100 kilometers. And then based on uh, mga publications, we can estimate the magnitude of the earthquake. So what is important about this? Alam natin yung magnitude ng earthquake, alam natin kung ano yung potential na hazard. Alam din natin kung gaano kalakas yung pwedeng mangyaring uh, ground shaking based on the simulations na gagawin natin. We also establish yung mga historical earthquakes. On other parts of the Philippines, just like on the southern part of Mindanao, we have the different active faults. Meron tayong tinatawag na Cotabato Fault System, Tangbulan Fault sa may Davao, de, uh, Davao del Sur, and the Degas Fault dito sa may Davao del Sur din. And for every segment of the fault, meron siyang corresponding na magnitude. Even in Central Davao, in, in Davao City, they have their own active faults and meron tayong mga magnitude 6.3 to 6.8 na pwedeng gumalaw doon. And within Metro Manila, as we all know, nandito yung value fault system which is uh, composed of two, seg two, two parts, yung East Value Fault and the West Value Fault. Yung East Value Fault, Mas maiksli siya, kaya magnitude 6.2 yung potential niya. While the West Valley Fault na around 90 to 100 kilometers, this fault is capable of generating a magnitude 7.2 to 7.4 na earthquake. So that's the scenario for faults. If we go now to uh, trenches in the Philippines, yung other, uh, other uh, earthquake generator, May mga scientists na na, na nag-aral nitong mga trenches na to, and they have known that this trenches, mas mataas yung possibility that these trenches will move segments by segments. So yung paper ni, ni, ni Ms. Salcedo ng 2012, she characterized yung segmentation ng trenches and the segmentation of trenches will tell us kung ano yung potential magnitude. So the maximum predictable earthquake models are based on historical tsunami genic events. Ito yung makikita natin on your left, yung mga epicenters, and the maximum credible earthquakes from the trenches based on its segmentation. Okay, So we know now the different sources of earthquakes, how we calculate the magnitude based on the length of the fault. 
and then how we determine now the time constraints. So determining the time, time constraints for an earthquake scenario. Ang paalala lang natin, ang DOST FIVOX ay hindi nagbibigay ng prediction patungkol sa salindol o tsunami. Hindi ito prediction but we are just identifying the recurrence interval. The recurrence interval is the average time span between past earthquakes with surface rupture. So, paano nalalaman ng mga taga FIVOX yung recurrence in interval? Ang ginagawa nat namin ay nagkakaroon tayo ng paleoseismic studies. Dahil sa maikling time span ng ating earthquakes, yung history ng earthquakes, the history of a Philippine earthquake may be around 500 years kasi doon lang nagkaroon ng documents. So we need to go beyond the 500 years. So ang objective natin is to determine past earthquakes. So what we do in FIVOX is we identify, uh, we conduct paleoseismic studies and we ident from these paleoseismic studies, hinuhukay namin yung fault sa ilalim and ina-expose natin yung itsura ng fault. Katulad ng makikita nyo dito sa right na picture, you can see layers of rocks. On the other side, may mga gravel siya pero wala siya dito sa, sa left side. Ang ibig sabihin, kaya siya nawala, nandito siya sa ilalim. And kaya siya nasa ilalim kasi nagkaroon ng fault movement. So we identify the number and timing of previous earthquake events. Uh, we determine the recurrence interval based on the movement of the fault as well as the relative magnitude of these past events. And this can be used for doing seismic scenarios. These are some examples of recurrence intervals that we have determined through paleoseismic studies. For example, yung valley fault system, ang recurrence interval niya is approximately every 400 to 600 years. Ibig sabihin, uh, nagkakaroon ng malalakas na lindol, mga surface rupturing earthquake along the valley fault system approximately every 400 to 600 years. And the last event was 1658. Okay, so that's uh, the recurrence interval. If we go to the Gabaldon segment of the Philippine Fault, yung Gabaldon segment, the last event was 1645. So um, yung uh, paper or yung ginawa nila Tsutsumi, they have identified that this Gabaldon segment is moving at least mga 500 to 600 years. And the last one was 1645. So ibig sabihin, medyo matagal na siyang hindi gumagalaw. Yung Philippine Fault sa Maymati, yung southern end ng Philippine Fault, uh, uh, based on paleoseismic studies, we have identified that this fault is moving every 400 to 1,000 years. And take note that Mati segment have never moved during historical times. So ibig sabihin, yung Mati segment, hindi pa siya gumagalaw for the past 400 years. And the recurrence interval is approximately 400 to 1,000 years. Yung Philippine Fault, Yung nakita natin, nag, uh, yung latest segment that moved last 2017, based on the paleoseismic studies, we know that this Philippine fault latest segment is moving in a very short interval. Nagmove siya every 60 to 120 years. Okay, so what is a worst case earthquake scenario? So to define this, a worst case earthquake scenario describes an earthquake that can bring the most severe impacts to a region or locality. So kung yung impact niya ay ito na yung most severe impacts to a region, ang ibig sabihin, that will be the worst case earthquake scenario. And the worst case earthquake scenario may be caused by the largest magnitude or the most credible earthquake maximum magnitude that a fault na malapit sa inyo can generate. Okay. Let's define now the big one. Yung big one, katulad ng sinabi ni Yusek Solidum kanina, it is a term used to describe a strong and damaging earthquake scenario. Basically, big one is not uh, totally a scientific term. It's, it's a, a term na ginagamit just to describe a strong and damaging earthquake scenario. If you search the term big one, may big one sa U.S., Sa, New, sa California, makikita niya yung mga articles about big one there. But here in the Philippines, yung big one is often equated to the worst case earthquake scenario that may happen to greater Metro Manila area. But in reality, we all know that FIVOX provides many worst case earthquake scenarios. 
Marami tayong binibigay na earthquake scenarios. And these worst case earthquake scenarios are localized. Di ba? Very specific yung location. Alam natin kung anong province, ano yung region. So therefore, there can be many big ones. So yung big one ay pwedeng mangyari sa Metro Manila, pwede siyang mangyari sa Davao, pwede siyang mangyari sa Cebu, pwede siyang mangyari sa Baguio, pwede siyang mangyari sa sa Boracay or, or sa Aklan. So every region, every province have their own big one. Why? Because we have lots of active faults. Di ba? Maraming active faults sa Pilipinas and these active faults may generate a worst case earthquake scenario in your region. So ito yung makikita nyo mga active faults. Uh, these active faults, you can visit yung fault finder or the hazard hunter uh, na, na, na website ng, ng, ng FIVOX and then you can determine yung haba nitong mga faults na to. Does the recent large earthquakes means ito na yung big one sa isang lugar? Maybe yes, maybe no. So you have to study kasi baka akalain natin, ah, nagkaroon na ng lindol noong 1990 dito sa, sa Baguio. Ito na yung big one sa, sa, sa Baguio siguro. Ang sagot doon, hindi. Kasi mamaya makikita nyo, mayroon pang worst case sa isang magnitude 7.8 Luzon earthquake. Could be the Cotabato earthquake na naramdaman sa Davao City be the largest Ang sagot natin, no. Kasi meron pang mga active faults dyan mismo sa Davao City. So we will now discuss some of the worst case earthquake scenarios. Hindi natin discuss yung bawat probinsya, but I will tell some some significant earthquakes na kailangan nating uh, ma-imagine, ma-realize kung ano yung pwedeng mangyari. Okay? So some worst case earthquake scenarios. Kanina, nabanggit ko na one of the largest earthquake along the Philippine Fault was the magnitude 7.9 along the Gabaldon segment of the Philippine Fault. So this earthquake, uh, ang haba ng fault uh, is more than uh, one, uh, 100 kilometers capable of generating magnitude 7.9. Bakit natin nasabi na malakas itong dindol na to? Isang, uh, yung historical marker sa Manila Cathedral describe the effect of the 1645 event. So makikita natin from this historical marker, the third cathedral built in 1614 and destroyed by the earthquake of 1645. So ibig sabihin, yung earthquake ng epicenter ay nasa may Gabaldon, Nueva Ecija, napabagsak niya or nasira niya yung simbahan ng Manila Cathedral noong 1645. Hindi ba malakas na lindol yun? Di ba? So, kung, kung maaring maulit uli based on the trenching na ginawa ni Latsutsumi noong 2006, this Gabaldon segment may future move kasi mahaba na siyang hindi gumagalaw. And based on this, Ito yung mga mapang nagawa natin for the worst case scenario of a fault movement along the Gabaldon segment of the Philippine Fault. Ito yung mga areas na may intensity 8. Ito yung mga areas na pwedeng tamaan ng liquefaction. Ito yung mga areas na pwedeng gawan ng landslide. These simulations are based on the Redis software that I will introduce later. Okay. So another case of a worst case scenario. Okay. Base sa mga pag-aaral na ginagawa ng FIVOX, meron tayong nakikitang unusual or kakaibang dami ng lindol dito sa part na to. Kung mapapansin nyo, on this part, may maraming mga lindol. This southern part, maraming mga lindol. This is uh, Surigao del Norte pababa, so papuntang Surigao del Sur. But on this space, makikita nyo hindi masyadong clustered yung mga earthquakes. Next, if we take a look at destructive earthquakes, ito yung mga epicenters ng mga destructive earthquakes, on the same area, makikita natin na meron ding absence ng destructive earthquakes. So yung absence na to ng destructive earthquakes plus the less clustering of the earthquakes here may mean na baka merong seismic gap dyan sa area na yan. Seismic gap means merong hindi pa gumagalaw ng segment ng Philippine Trench on that area. So ano yung ibig sabihin nun? Maaring itong seismic gap na to ay gumalaw. 
kung sakali mang gumalaw siya, based on the simulation, ito yung pwedeng maging scenario for a magnitude 8.2 movement along the Philippine Trench. So makikita nyo, ito yung bakanting lugar, ito yung uh, absent, ito yung seismic gap. Ganito siya kahaba, maybe around 200-300 kilometers yung length niya. If that fault or the trench will move, pwede siya mag-generate ng magnitude 8.2 and then yung mga nakikita nating mga red line uh, red polygons or red colored areas these areas will experience intensity 8 earthquake and then as you go to the uh, eastern side a uh, western side bumababa na yung intensity pero mahalaga you know that this intensity 8 intensity 7 intensity 6 na mga areas these areas pwede silang maka-experience ng mga damages nagsa-start ang damage sa isang lindol kapag ang nararamdaman ng lindol ay intensity 6 pataas. So you, you you worry about that. Yung intensity 1 to intensity 5 wala pang damage yan. Pero pag ang lindol ay intensity 6 pataas, pwede na siyang mag-cause ng damage. Trench yung pinag-uusapan natin. So ang ibig sabihin, pag may trench movement, pwedeng magkaroon ng uh, uh, ng tsunami. So, based on the tsunami simulation, alam natin yung length ng fault, yung magnitude. We all know, based on simulation, that this area can can be uh, can can generate yung yung fault, yung trench movement na yon can generate a five to nine meter high tsunami along the eastern coastal areas of Samar Island and Leyte Island. So ito yung projection, ito yung assume na height ng tsunami. Itong scenario na to, para mas maintindihan natin, eh comparable siya or maaaring mas mataas pa doon sa Yolanda event ng 2013. So there's a, a potential for a tsunami on that area, an intensity 8 earthquake, and that will be the big one. It historical times mula nung dumating yung mga Spaniards hindi pa siya gumagalaw and based on the uh, recurrence interval that we have done this fault is moving every 400 to 1000 years and based on the simulations uh, na ginawa ng Redas we all know that these areas will experience intensity 8 yung Davao del Sur Davao del Norte will have intensity 7 this will be larger compared to the 2019 series of earthquakes there in Cotabato and Davao del Sur. Malayo na to pero dahil sa taas ng magnitude ng earthquake, mas mataas yung pwedeng maramdaman sa Davao del Sur, Davao City. And for Davao Oriental, intensity 8, pwedeng hanggang intensity 9 yung pwedeng maramdaman nila. For Metro Manila, we all know that based on the polyseismic studies, it has uh, moved for the past 1,400 years. Nagkaroon na ng apat na lindol for the past 1,400 years. And the recurrence interval is around 400 to 600 years. The last major earthquake was 1658. And based on the simulation, Metro Manila, parts of Bulacan, Rizal, Cavite, and Laguna will experience intensity 8 na earthquake. So that will be one of the big ones for Metro Manila and probably yung Bulacan, Rizal, Cavite, and Laguna, yung, ano, yung greater Metro Manila area. Not only the scenario for the West Valley Fault, even for a scenario along the Manila Trench, yung Manila Trench is capable of generating magnitude 8.2. The estimated height of tsunami sa Manila Bay is 3.5 to 5.5 meters. So ibig sabihin, if this is the scenario for Metro Manila, Makikita nyo na yung Bataan, Sambales, Pangasinan, La Union, il, uh, papuntang Ilocos Norte, Ilocos Sur, they will also have a scenario for this magnitude 8.2. So, hindi tayo mag -re rely sa scenario ng Metro Manila, we need to rely on the scenario dyan mismo sa lugar ninyo, sa coastal areas along the West Luzon Island. So, bakit ba natin 
pag, kailangan paghandaan yung isang worst case scenario. So, alam natin kapag nangyari yung isang worst case scenario, maraming pwedeng mawala. Pwedeng magkaroon ng disaster, maaaring maapektuhan tayo. Ano yung epekto sa atin? Pwedeng maraming mamatay, maraming ma-injured, pwedeng ma-damage yung mga buildings, infrastructures, properties, and equipment. Pwedeng ma-displace yung mga tao dahil sa isang tsunami. Pwedeng mawalan sila ng lugar, mawalan sila ng bahay. There could be loss of lifelines. Mawawala yung tubig, energy, electricity, communication. Masira yung mga bridges natin. Masira yung mga ports natin, airports, seaports, and yung mga railways natin. There could be a damage to or interruption of food supply. Pwedeng matigil yan kasi nasira yung mga kalsada. There could be loss of public and other critical services, loss of business or revenues from business interruption, disruption of economic development. Baka mas malala pa sa COVID-19 na nararanasan natin kung sakaling magkaroon ng worst case scenario sa inyong lugar. So ito yung kailangan nating paghandaan. If we know these numbers, if we know kung gaano karami yung mamamatay, may injured, anong mga buildings yung pwedeng masira, pwede nating paghandaan. Pwede nating mabawasan yung impact ng lindol. Given enough data, we can determine specific impacts to a locality. If we have informations about the number of people, if we have information about building classification, if we know the age of the building, alam natin kung nasaan yung mga bridges na matatanda, we can have specific impacts to a locality. Just like what we have done during the MMIR study, uh, these are numbers based on MMIRs, yung potential impact in Metro Manila because of a magnitude 7.2. Kung wala tayong gagawin, maaaring 38% ng residential buildings yung pwedeng masira. 38% yung 10 to 30 story buildings yung pwedeng masira. For public buildings, 30 to 35%. That was 2004. Pero kung alam natin itong mga numbers na to, dahil sa projection natin, dahil sa worst case earthquake scenario, because of the big one scenario, we can now establish now, we can do our planning. Maaaring maraming mamatay and based sa calculation, 33,000 yung maaaring mamatay. And napag-alaman na maraming na mamamatay because of this scenario dahil sa... Uh, pagbagsak ng mga residential buildings kasi 38%. Imagine yung 38%, babagsak yung building at sa loob ng bahay, nandun yung mga tao, syempre pwedeng may injured sila, pwedeng mamatay. So ngayon pa lang, dahil sa alam natin na maraming residential buildings yung pwedeng masira, kailangan nating tignan ngayon gaano ba katibay yung mga bahay namin. So para malaman nyo kung paano nyo malalaman kung matibay ba yung bahay nyo, kailangan umaten kayo bukas sa ating talk series number 3 because uh, si Hans i-discuss niya yung how safe is my house na na, na aming tool okay uh, that was 2004 data nung 2016 we have updated the data and included yung Bulacan, Rizal, Cavite, Laguna and Pampanga and based on the worst case scenario along the West Valley Fault ganito karami yung pwedeng mamatay okay Using the GeoRisk platform, we can also determine yung mga pwedeng maapektuhan na population based on the uh, tsunami impact. So yung GeoRisk na platform, pwede kayong turuan para malaman ninyo kung gaano karaming mga tao yung pwedeng maapektuhan ng tsunami, gaano karaming mga buildings yung pwedeng uh, ma, ma expose sa tsunami. And kung alam natin to alam natin kung paano natin siya paghahandaan. So why, what is the importance of an accurate information dissemination of an earthquake scenarios? Tingin namin, if we have disseminated accurate information about earthquake scenarios, yung bawat individual can properly imagine the risk that they face. So ibig sabihin, Uh, tapos na yung ano eh, tapos na yung stage na tinuturo natin ah ito yung ground shaking ground rupture dapat ngayon na realize ng isang common na tao ano ba yung panganib na nakaambang sa kanila sabi nga ni Yusek Solidum kailangan nating ma-imagine yung pwedeng mangyari so let's imagine now 
Pag nagkaroon ng isang malakas na lindol dahil sa movement ng isang fault sa aming lugar, maaaring itong bahay ko ay masira. So kung na-imagine ko na maaaring masira yung bahay ko, maaaring magkaroon ako ng injury. So ganun yung imagination natin. Pero para hindi mangyari yon, kailangan ako maghanda. ba? Diba? So hindi sa tinatakot namin kayo, pero gusto lang namin ma-imagine ninyo yung potential na pwedeng mangyari. And dahil sa potential na yon na pwedeng mangyari, kailangan namin kayong makumbinse na kailangan yung maghanda hindi bukas, kundi ngayon pa lang kailangan nyo ng maghanda. Local governments can determine the appropriate strategies for mitigation, preparedness, response, and coordination. Diba? May mga roles yung ating local government units, yung ating national government. But wag nating i-rely sa local government. Marami na silang ginagawa. We have to contribute as a community. Varying impacts to localities depending on exposure, vulnerabilities, and capacities can be illustrated by, by providing an, an worst-case earthquake scenarios or big one in your area. When distinctive impacts are explained, individuals and communities can understand that disasters can be prevented or mitigated. Hindi naman tayo tapos na na, ay, mamamatay ako. Hindi ganon. Sinasabi namin nito para makonbinsin namin kayo na kailangan may gawin kayong hakbang. Kailangan yung gumawa ng aksyon, kailangan yung uh, paghandaan, kailangan sumasali tayo sa mga earthquake drills, kailangan nagkakaroon kayo ng mga go bag sa loob ng bahay nyo dahil sa mga senaryos na to. Okay? So yung kaninang sinasabi kong tools and services that can be used for scenario-based impact assessments Isang tool na dinevelop ng FIVOX is yung Rapid Earthquake Damage Assessment System. Yung Redo software, this is a very uh, important software and tool na kailangang alam ng bawat local government unit. So dapat, ang, ang, ang idea natin dito is dapat bawat local government units alam ang Redo software. Dahil sa Redo software, you can do hazard assessment you can uh, identify the big one in your area by using this Reda software. You can put up exposure database para alam nyo kung gaano mga buildings, gaano karaming buildings yung pwedeng masira. Pwede nyo uh, magkaroon din kayo ng building damage and loss estimation. So, we encourage yung mga local government units na hindi pa nagkakaroon ng Reda's Training, kailangan um, makipag-collaborate kayo sa FIVOX because this is a very important tool. Malaki yung maitutulong nito sa inyo para magkaroon kayo ng isang science-based earthquake scenario in your area. Another tool na pwede nyo gamitin is yung GeoRisk platform. Meron tayong Hazard Hunter, Geoanalytics, and Geomapper. These are also tools na makakatulong sa mga local government units natin and even mga private companies, private uh, individuals, uh, your community, even the Hazard Hunter. From Hazard Hunter, uh, one step lang, one click, alam nyo na yung hazard sa inyong lugar. And tomorrow will be another day for, for understanding Hazard Hunter. So we encourage you to, to join us tomorrow. Okay? So key messages, earthquake risk information is derived from earthquake scenarios that are scientifically determined by DOST FIVOX. So we have science-based information for deriving earthquake scenarios. Every region or province in the Philippines is threatened by its own worst-case earthquake scenario. So every region, every province have their own big one. Preparedness at the local, community, and family level must be based on the identified worst-case earthquake scenario because, of, because the exact occurrence of earthquakes cannot be predicted, tatandaan, it is important that Filipinos are always earthquake-ready. Therefore, DOS the FIVOX should encourage the local government units and the public, yung mga nanonood sa amin ngayon, to know their scenario-based hazards and risks. So maraming salamat po. Thank you. Ayan, thank you very much, Sir Jeff, for that very thorough explanation. At sana po ay naintindihan natin yung ating earthquake scenarios. Pero while we give Sir Jeff a chance to, to take a break and sip some water, uh, I would like to remind everyone to answer po yung ating 
evaluation form, ay yung ating attendance form, later yung ating evaluation form para po makuha nyo po yung copy ng ating information materials, pati na rin yung ating e-certificate. Just make sure po na working yung ating email na ilalagay and double check po yung spelling na inyong pangalan. Okay, and also I would like to encourage everyone to send in your questions para sagutin ni Sir Jeff. Just type your name, affiliation, and your questions at ating chat box or comment section. So, let's grab the chance na po na magtanong kay Sir Jeff. He is a geologist and a fault finder para mas marami pa tayong malaman tungkol sa fault and earthquakes. So, Sir Jeff, are we ready to answer some questions na? Yes, Missy. Okay. So, I will read some questions that we've gathered. Yung ating pong attendance link ay ilalagay po ng ating secretariat sa ating chat box or sa comment section. Okay, so our first question, Sir Jeff, what about a scenario of a magnitude 7.2 in Central Mindanao? So, diretsya hang tanong, Sir, sa Central Mindanao po ba ay merong or posible magkaroon ng magnitude 7.2 in earthquake? Yes, there could be a magnitude 7 plus na earthquake dyan sa Central Mindanao. And the reason is, if you go to Hazard Hunter PH, hanapin niyo yung lugar niyo, merong malapit na fault dyan sa lugar ninyo. So, ang sagot, yes. And para malaman niyo kung ano yung source, you go to Hazard Hunter PH for the uh, nearest fault in your area. And that fault may generate a magnitude 7 plus na lindo. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Jeff, and thank you rin po sa mga nagsised ng ating questions. I think marami tayong mga similar questions tungkol sa ano po ba yung fault na malapit sa kanila and kung paano po ba nila ito mahahanap. So, kailangan abangan po yan ng ating mga viewers para po sa ating day 3 ng ating FIVOX Talk Series na i-discuss po ni Mr. Hans. So, next question, Sir Jeff. Sir, bakit most of the earthquakes na nare-record sa history natin, bakit po laging nasa Mindanao? Kung hindi daw po siya nagkakamali, ay most ng records ay sa Mindanao. Can you okay. clarify, Sir Jeff? Uh, okay. Uh, yung historical accounts natin, based sa ginawa din ni Dr. Bautista, uh, if, if you can search yung mga historical earthquakes, makikita niya yung mga publications ni Dr. Bautista. And yung description niya, uh, description na ginawa ng mga pare, eh syempre dun sa mga lugar na meron tayong mga 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 simbahan, merong community. So naka-concentrate doon. Ah, uh, maaaring marami sa Mindanao kasi maraming parts ng Mindanao are already settled during that time. Pero marami din ang uh, ang accounts sa may Metro Manila, dito sa Central Luzon, sa Southern Luzon, maraming mga accounts ng earthquake din. So hindi lang naka-concentrate sa sa Mindanao. Ang hindi pa natin uh, napag-aaralan and baka meron tayong mga kasamang taga Mindanao dyan is to search yung mga historical accounts na nanggagaling sa mga mosque natin. Yung mga kapatid nating mga Muslim, baka meron silang mga information about historical earthquakes on their area, baka makatulong din yan para ma-enlarge ma, 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 ma natin yung earthquake database ng, ng Pilipinas. Thank you. Tama, Sir Jeff. Kasi nabanggit nyo po kanina sa presentation nyo, yung iba pong mga records, lalo na yung mga luma, nakikita natin dun po sa mga parang uh, sayan dun sa harapan ng simbahan. So nakalagay yung record na na-damage yung church ng Earthquake, so baka po yung ating mga mosque ay meron din po silang ganong kind of history that we have to explore. Yes. So next question, Sir Jeff, ano po ang potential magnitude ng lubang fault kung sakaling magkaroon ng malakas na lindol? Okay, uh, ang lubang fault, uh, medyo ano din yan, mahaba yung fault na yan. Uh, mostly yung mga faults natin, they are capable of generating magnitude 6, magnitude 7 na er mga earthquakes probably it will not generate a magnitude 8 earthquake dahil sa exceeding fault pero ang possibility is for our active faults will move around magnitude 7 magnitude 6 magnitude 7 plus na lindol thank you sir jeff so sa tingin ko na maganda nating i-emphasize po na we am na sinasabi po namin ito dahil po minsan uh, the larger the magnitude lalo na kung mababaw yung source nito ay can create po yung mataas na intensity. Tama po, Sir Jeff? Tama, tama. 
kahit na magnitude 6 lang siya, pero mababaw yung pinanggalingan niya, medyo malakas yung epekto sa 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 sa, sa lupa sa community natin. So titingnan natin not only the magnitude but also the depth of the earthquake kasi mas mababaw, pwedeng mas nararamdaman ng mga tao. Medyo malalim, magnitude 8 pero 100 uh, 1000 kilometers, 100 kilometers yung depth, pwedeng hindi na makaapekto yan sa surface. Thank you, Sir Jeff, for clarifying that. So, importante po na tignan natin, hindi lang yung magnitude, pati rin po yung intensity. So, we have a question po from QCDRRMO. Sir Jeff, is there an earthquake scenario that will damage either the Angat Dam or La Mesa Dam that may lead to flooding? Okay. Ang mahalaga dito is that we have already identified the worst case scenario for Metro Manila. So, nung pinakita natin itong worst case scenario, ang ginawa ngayon ng ating mga private companies, ng ating national government is to prepare for this. So, ibig sabihin, alam ngayon ng La Mesa Dam, alam ngayon ng Angat Dam na ito yung potential. So, anong ginawa nila? Ngayon pa lang, na-retrofit na nila. So, there's no chance na babagsak itong mga dams na to kasi ngayon pa lang, pinaghandaan na nila. Just like what we have done with together with the DPWH and DILG, dahil sa mga worst case earthquake scenarios, ang nangyari, nagkaroon tayo ngayon ng infra audit. Yung mga public buildings, nagkaroon ng audit. And because of the earthquake scenarios, alam nila using infra audit, Ngayon pa lang nire-retrofit na nila yung mga buildings na maaaring bumagsak. Not only buildings but also bridges in Metro Manila nagkakaroon na ng retrofitting. So yun yung maganda. Pag may earthquake scenario, meron tayong ngayong chance para i-retrofit natin yung mga buildings, yung mga facilities natin. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Jeff. So I think yun po yung point doon. No? Na itong ating earthquake scenario, sinasabi na namin sa inyo para po nakakapaghanda tayo. And following that po, Sir Jeff, we have another question. Is Bicol region can be affected by the big one? What magnitude po? Okay, sa Bicol region, may mga faults din dyan na makikita nyo sa Hazard Hunter PH. And yung Hazard Hunter PH, they are also, uh, you can determine yung closest to you, gaano siya kahaba, merong measuring tool doon sa, sa Hazard Hunter PH. And then, kung titignan natin, historically, meron ng malalakas na lindol na nangyari sa Bicol region. So, ibig sabihin, kung nangyari na siya historically, maaari siyang mangyari in the future. Thank you. Pero, Sir Jeff, is it correct to say na kahit po you have a fault na malapit sa inyo, pwede pa rin po kayong maapektuhan ng fault na malayo naman sa inyong area? Tama, tama. Ma maari pa rin kayong maapektuhan ng mga lindol or yung mga faults na malalayo sa inyo. Pero may difference 'yan, 'di ba? Yung tinuturo sa atin ni Yusek Solidum. Pag malapit yung fault, ang mararamdaman nating ground shaking mabilis, 'di ba? Yung high frequency na na, na lindol, 'yun yung mararamdaman natin. Pero pag malayo yung source ng earthquake, yung mga far field na earthquakes, ang mararamdaman nating shaking yung maano, ma ma long period yung dahan-dahan pero malakas pa rin. So may difference 'yon. Pero yung yung dahan-dahan na 'yon, maaari tayong maapektuhan din ng lindol na 'yon. Thank you. Hey, thank you Sir Jeff. Uh, do we have fault and trenches capable of generating a magnitude 9 and above? Uh, for faults no, for active faults in the Philippines, ha, walang mag walang mag-generate diyan ng magnitude 9. Uh, for trenches, uh, may mga magnitude 8. Di ba yung pinakita ko kanina yung ginawa ni Ms. Salcedo, she uh, nagkaroon ng mga segments ng fault. And some of these segments may generate a magnitude 8. Pero hindi natin tinatanggal yung possibility na yung magkakatabing segments ay gumalaw din at one time. So kung sakaling maggalaw yung magkakatabing segments, it may generate a higher magnitude. It could be magnitude 8 plus, it could extend up to magnitude 9. So, hindi natin tinatanggal yung possibility. Pero, dapat ang magmove doon ay yung mga magkakatabing segments. So, baka, kung baga one time, big time silang gagalaw. But based on the study of uh, Ms. Joanne, uh, ang suggestion nila is this is the, the most probable na pwedeng mangyari, yung mga segments ng mga trenches. Thank you. 
So, Jeff, when you mentioned po na ito pong mga faults na magkakata ay pwedeng mag- Ibig sabihin po ba na an earthquake can trigger another earthquake sa iba namang fault? Uh, magandang question yan. Uh, yan yung tinatawag nating uh, stress transfer. Uh, na, 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 naramdaman or nangyari yan during the 2019 series of earthquakes sa may Cotabato. Nangyari yung unang earthquake noong October tapos sunod-sunod yung lindol sa lugar nila. Dahil sa yung mga faults na nasa paligid niya ay gumalaw. So ano ba yung stress transfer? Para lang siyang ano, nasa isang crowded na area kayo kahit na may physical distancing. Diba? Kunwari crowded area, may isa akong taong na itulak tapos yung taong tinulak ko dahil sa masikip yung isang lugar, pwede niyang itulak yung isa. So ganun yung nangyari sa 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 mga faults na magkakatabi, pwedeng yung 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 force or yung energy ay ma-transfer niya sa kabila and maaari siyang uh, maaari siyang gumalaw din. Uh, may mga scientists tayo dito sa Fivox that also studies this uh, stress transfer. So nalalaman nila kung gumalaw yung fault na to, saan na-transfer yung fault na to, ay uh, yung yung stress na yon and that stress pwede siyang gumalaw in the future. Diba? Hindi siya prediction, pero pwede siyang gumalaw in the future. So, stress transfer. Following that stress transfer, sir, pwede naman po ba na volcanic eruption can trigger an earthquake? Can volcanic eruption trigger an earthquake? Okay, uh, classify natin. There are two types of earthquakes. Merong tectonic earthquakes and merong mga volcanic earthquakes. Pag volcanic earthquakes, dahil siya sa, sa pagbasag ng mga bato sa, sa loob ng vulkan dahil sa pag-move ng magma. Uh, Normally, um, ang mas nangyayari ay yung uh, kapag gumalaw yung isang fault na malapit, pwede niyang matrigger yung paggalaw ng magma. Yan e eh kung meron ng magma supply dun sa loob ng isang active volcano. Ang maganda nating example and merong mga group of scientists na naniwa, na, na na merong uh, mga studies about this is that uh, nung nangyari yung earthquake noong 1990 that was central Luzon na earthquake less than 11 months or less than uh, one year nagkaroon ng eruption ng pinatubo. So ang sinabi nila is that because of the ground shaking na na-generate ng magnitude 7.8 earthquake dito sa pinatubo area, nagalaw yung magma, yung magma chamber niya, and then mas napabilis yung pagsabog ng vulkan. Pero ang mahalaga doon, eh nandun na yung magma. Kung baga, unti-unting gumagalaw na yung magma doon sa loob ng pinatubo na alam nating isang active na volcano dahil sa uh, napabilis, dahil doon sa ground shaking, kaya... Kung baga na-initiate, napabilis niya, kaya nagkaroon ng eruption yung pinatubo. Maaring ganun yung senaryo. For uh, a volcano na mag-trigger, maaring uh, yung mga faults within the volcano. Dahil sa movement ng magma, pwede niyang ipagalawin yung mga faults na yon. But these faults, hindi naman siya mahaba, maiksi lang siya. So ibig sabihin, lesser yung magnitude ng, ng lindol. Thank you, Sir Jeff. So sa tingin ko, isang example na narinig ko from you, Sex Solidum, before is yung parang meron kang bote ng coke na pagka mo, kung may laman, pag binuksan mo, pwede siyang lombas. Pero kung wala, kahit Ay, anong shake mo, walang lalabas. Tama. So, Sir, ito naman po, uh, more on preparedness yung kanyang question. Uh, kung kayo po ay nasa isang high-rise building ng office, what intensity po would you recommend na mag-evacuate? Okay. Um, ang recommendation ng FIVOX is that if your building is structurally sound, ibig sabihin maganda yung pagkakatayo ng building, tama yung pagkakatayo, hindi siya babagsak pag nagkaroon ng lindol, maglalabas lang tayo or mag evacuate tayo kapag intensity 6 pataas. Yan e eh kung structurally sound yung building natin. Okay? Ano, yung, ano yung intensity 6? Ang intensity 6, yaan na yung gumagalaw yung mga gamit sa loob ng bahay. So ibig sabihin yung cabinet, yung monitors ng 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 computers niyo, yung television sets niyo, refrigerator cabinets gumagalaw na siya at intensity 6. At intensity 6, sabi ko nga kanina, doon nagsisimula yung damage and the damage at intensity 6 are mga hairline cracks, mga maliliit na cracks sa mga walls. So ayun, yun yung intensity 6. Pero tatandaan Intensity 6 if your building is structurally sound. Okay. Thank you, Sir Jeff. And before I go to 
my follow-up question, I would like to remind po yung ating mga participants sa Zoom to turn off your camera and your microphone po para hindi po madistract yung ating pong speaker. So following that question po na pag nasa high-rise building, sir, aakyat po ba ako o bababa? Ba? Okay. Um, ang, ang aming recommendation at dapat na sinusunod ninyo, after a strong shaking na intensity 6 pataas, you need to go down of the building. Yun yung mas safe. Maari kasing yung building at uh, at the first main shock, yung unang lindol, maaring hindi pa bumagsak yung building. Pero yung mga susunod na aftershocks, yun yung magkukos para yung building ay mag-collapse. So ang, ang, ang kailangan gawin after the ground shaking, you need to get out of the building and wait for the instruction ng mga building managers natin or building administrators na safe na bang bumalik sa building. Kailangan natin hihintayin yung instruction na yun. Thank you, Sir Jeff. So we have a question po. Kung gaano kadalas na-update ang ating mga hazard maps and bakit po may bumabagsak na building kung may JU hazard maps po na basihan para sa building? Okay. Again, uh, uh, Sir, wait lang po. I would like to remind our participants to turn off po yung atin pong microphone. Thank you. Okay, gaano kadalas yung ating uh, paggawa ng mga hazard maps? Uh, marami tayong mga geologists ngayon sa Freevox and they are doing a good job of uh, updating our hazard maps. Ang mahalaga dito is that kapag nagkaroon ng update sa hazard maps natin, uh, ang ginagawa ng Freevox is we inform our local government units. Pinapadala natin yung mga bagong mapa sa local government units and ina-update natin siya kaagad sa hazard hunter. So yun yung maganda. So lahat ng makikita niyo sa Hazard Hunter, kapag merong updated, ina-update siya kagad. Yes, sir, bakit po ba bumabagsak na building pa kung meron naman ng hazard maps na basis na ating building code? Okay, uh, hindi natin may iwasan na may mga substandards pa rin na mga construction. Maaring substandards sa design, hindi tama yung design ng structure. Maaring substandards sa materials na ginamit. At maaari ding stand, uh, substandard sa workmanship. So maraming factors na kailangan natin i-consider. Pero dapat, maganda, dapat nagpa-follow ng building code. If you follow the building code, yung buildings nyo at intensity 8, ma hindi siya babagsak talaga. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Jeff. So we have another question po. Uh, is it possible for Cebu to experience an earthquake above 6 from central Cebu fault system? Yes, yes. Uh, that faults can generate a magnitude 6 plus na earthquake. And a magnitude 6 plus na earthquake dyan sa Cebu na mababaw, you may experience intensity 7 hanggang intensity 8 na lindol. Ang intensity 8, yung halos nahirapan na kayong tumayo sa lakas ng lindol. Thank you. So Jeff, curious question lang. Pwede pa tayong maka-experience ng higit pa sa intensity 8? Okay. Uh, personally, ako, naramdaman ko na yung intensity 7 to intensity 8. That was October, uh, alam ba yun? October 29 of 2019. Kung sumama ka sa akin ng Missy, naramdaman mo sana yun. Pero uh, yung intensity higher than 8, yes, pwede siya. Based sa description natin, uh, mostly damaging, totally damaged. And ang nakikita kong scenario is a scenario ng tsunami. Kapag tumama ang isang tsunami sa isang lugar, pag uh, maraming mga buildings ang nakatayo sa coastal area, makikita natin na baka totally wipe out sila. Katulad nung nangyari noong 1976 Morogov earthquake and tsunami, na totally uh, yung mga bahay ay na-wash out because of that uh, tsunami and earthquake noong 1976. Thank you, Sir Jeff. So, nabanggit nyo po kanina yung tungkol po sa 1990 earthquake. So, yung ating pong um, audience ay nagtatanong kung kamusta naman po ba ang San Manuel Fault sa Pangasinan kung pwede po itong gumalaw. Yes. Uh, ang San Manuel Fault, uh, yung fault na gumalaw ng 1990 is the digdig segment. So, nandito siya sa may uh, Nueva Ecija, Pakyat ng Nueva Vizcaya. Ang San Manuel Fault, ay tumatawid ng, uh, sa may Pangasinan area, Pangasinan going to La Union. And based on historical accounts, this San Manuel Fault has already moved noong 
if my uh, memory uh, is right, around 1700s nagkaroon na ng movement ng fault dyan sa San Manuel. Um, honestly, we haven't done any paleoseismic trenching there in San Manuel, pero nakikita namin na uh, in the future, kung merong mag-aaral or merong kaming gagawin yung mga trenching dyan, we will determine the recurrence interval. But yes, San Manuel Fault is an active fault. It, the last movement is around 1700s. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sir Jeff. And I once again, thank you po sa mga ating participants. Very active po sila today. So we have a question po regarding naman po sa fault sa Mindanao. Um, what do we know po about the Central Dabao Fault System? And yung isa naman po ang question po niya is, there is a series of earthquakes off the coast of Davao Oriental a few days ago. Should we be concerned about it? Okay, first muna yung, uh, ano yung se se the Central Davao Fault System. Yes. Yan yung nasa Davao City. Uh, ang good thing is that uh, we have a very good map for that fault. So, uh, nung, kaya lang ba? Nung 2019, uh, we have finished the fault. Uh, yan, nag nagawa na namin. Uh, Si, sa, sa, nilich kami ni, ni Kat Kat. And noong 2019, before the series of earthquakes in, in Cotabato, dyan sa may Davao del Sur, we have visited Davao City. And uh, doon sa is dalawang, uh, dalawang barangay, yung Bago Oshiro and uh, ano yung isang barangay, Mintal, we have already identified the fault on the ground. So nagkaroon kami ng walk the fault on that area. So alam ng mga communities ngayon dyan sa Davao City kung nasaan yung fault dyan sa may Bago Oshiro and Mintal. Uh, dahil sa pandemic na naputol yung aming walk the fault but in the future sana masundan yung, uh, yung walk the fault sa ginagawa natin dyan sa Davao City. Thank you. And the next question, your series of earthquakes at Davao Oriental. Yes. Ah, uh, yes. There are series of earth. Ah, uh, merong mga earthquakes jan sa Davao Oriental offshore, and most probably the generator of this uh, earthquake is the uh, Philippine Trench. Hindi pa tayo nakakita ng ng major earthquake along the Mati segment jan sa Davao Oriental. So yes, it's a concern na kailangan nating uh, tignan kasi it just telling us na merong marapit na fault dyan sa lugar ninyo. May malapit na earthquake generator na nasa dagat. And kapag yung earthquake generator ay nasa dagat, hindi lang ground shaking yung kailangan nating paghandaan. Kailangan din nating paghandaan yung tsunami sa mga areas na nasa coastal. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sir Jeff. So we have a question po dito na I think very interesting siya. Meron po bang lugar sa Pilipinas na walang identified fault? And in your opinion, where in the Philippines is the safest or earthquake-proof location, Sir Jeff? Okay, uh, based sa current map ng, ng, ng FIVOX, wala tayong namamapang active faults dito sa may main Palawan Island. So ang tanong bakit sir bakit walang map, walang ano diyan walang mga faults diyan sa Palawan. Um, ang basic na sagot diyan is because yung Palawan together with the West Philippine Sea, yung China and the rest of Asia, they belong to a different tectonic plate. So kumbaga yung Palawan ay nakatungtong sa isang malaking bloke ng bato. Na yung malaking bloke ng bato kasama doon yung West Philippine Sea, yung China and nasa ano siya nasa stable block and this stable block unti-unti siyang gumagalaw at papalapit sa Pilipinas. Ang second na tanong, meron bang earthquake uh, proof na lugar parang ganun? Yes sir. Uh, safest po. Safe earthquake proof. Okay, in terms of active faults, yun yung sagot, yung Palawan walang active faults doon. Pero, 'di ba, gaya ng tanong natin kanina Missy, 'di ba? Yung mga faults na malayo doon sa lugar ninyo ay maaaring makaapekto sa inyo. So ibig sabihin, kung kayo ay nasa Palawan na walang active fault, yung mga active faults na nasa may Mindoro, yung active faults na nandyan sa may Aklan, yung Manila Trench, ay maaaring makaapekto pa rin sa Palawan. So yung paghanda ay hindi dapat maging kampante yung mga taga-Palawan kasi maaari pa rin kayong makaranas ng malakas na lindol and because merong threat ng Manila, ng Manila Trench, 
pwede kayong maapektuhan ng 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 tsunami not only the the threat from the manila trench even the uh, yung earthquakes coming from the negros and sulu trench maaring maapekto yan sa palawan and historically palawan have already experienced mga malala, mga lindol and even tsunami in the past historically Thank you. Yes. Okay, so yun po, i-remind lang natin yung ating mga participants na kahit po malayo or malapit kayo dun po sa fault, importante po na lagi po tayong handa kasi maari pa rin tayong maapektuhan, lalo na po kung mababaw yung uh, source ng earthquake. Tama po, Sir Jeff? Yes. Yes, and pwede po itong mag dun sa damages. Kagaya po nung nangyari po nung, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, 2019, yun sa Tarlac po yung Earthquake and then sa Pampanga yung maraming damages. Tama po ba? Tama, tama. Um, yung epicenter niya nandun malapit sa may Sambales na area pero malaki yung epekto sa, sa Pampanga. Yun. So Sambales po yung ano, epicenter. Oo, even the, yung 1968 na Ruby Tower Earthquake, uh, yung epicenter niya ay nandun sa may Kasiguran Aurora. Ang nasirang mga buildings ay nandito sa may Metro Manila. Manila is around 250 kilometers away pero nasira yung mga buildings sa Metro Manila. And po. So, next question naman po Sir Jeff, are the offices of Fevox siguro ito ang ibig niya sabihin yung ating mga seismic stations uh, are being monitored na where earthquakes are being monitored through many instruments strategically located where there are no fault lines. So, or no faults rather. Anong ulit? Ulit yung question? So yung atin po bang mga seismic stations ay nakalagay po ba kung saan walang fault? Ah. Basically, dapat wala siya dun sa ibabaw ng fault. Kasi syempre kung meron tayong housing dun, pag nasa ibabaw ng fault, pwedeng masira yung, yung building. Yung mga seismic stations natin, um, naka-strategically located all over the Philippines, Meron silang specific na binabantayan ng mga lugar. Meron silang specific na mga faults na binabantayan. Nilalagay siya malapit, malayo sa 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 mga faults natin, sa mga earthquake uh, earthquake sources natin. Even Palawan na walang fault, meron tayong mga seismic stations diyan. And sa pagkakatanda ko, sa Palawan lang ay meron tayong at least tatlong seismic stations diyan sa Palawan Group of Islands. Yeah, thank you. Okay po. So thank you and also to remind the public na yung ang pong mga seismic stations ay wala po sa ibabaw ng fault and we also want to remind you po na dapat kung magtatayo po tayo ng building or structures, hindi po dapat sa ibabaw ng fault. Okay, we also have another question po Sir Jeff. Uh, more on preparedness naman po ito, given the possible disaster losses that you've mentioned in your presentation, what is the concrete plan of the national government to respond dun sa impact niya sa Metro Manila? Okay, uh, marami na, maraming ginagawa na yung, Filip yung national government and even your own local government units. They have their own mga contingency plan. As a, as a whole, as a Metro Manila, we have the O-Plan Yakal Plus. Marami nang ginagawa. Uh, they have provisions now for the yung uh, mga lugar na babagsakan ng mga relief supplies, ng mga, uh, mga makakatulong sa atin. Makakatulong means within the Philippines, yung mga regions na pwedeng makatulong sa Metro Manila and even countries outside the Philippines may help us. So merong mga pagpaplanong ginagawa ang ating national government, ang ating local government units. Ang kasunod dito, kailangan tayo din ay kumilos. Hindi siya, uh, hindi siya trabaho lang ng local government, ng national government. Dapat within your community, within your uh, family, you, you need to prepare. Kailangan paghandaan natin. Kasi for the first uh, few hours after the event, it will be our, uh, at, kay, ano tayo, uh, magiging, ano tayo, magiging isolated tayo. Hindi tayo agad-agad matutulungan ng local government units natin. So, we need to prepare for this individually and within your family, even within your kapitbahay. Dapat nag-uusap kayo on how you, how you plan for this. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Jeff. So aside po dun po sa preparedness ng national government, it is important that we in our family and individually are preparing for it. So we have another question po, Sir Jeff. Um, what is the appropriate response nung po mga nasa coastal areas in Pasay if they experience the 7.2 earthquake? 
should they evacuate po ba? Pakiunya, Mrs. Um, ano po ang appropriate response ng mga nasa coastal areas, specifically sa Pasay, if they experience the 7.2 earthquake? Should they evacuate or not? Okay, uh, ang mahalaga dito is you know the natural signs of an impending tsunami. If you are living or if you are in a coastal area, pag malapit kayo sa dagat, dapat tatandaan nyo yung tatlong natural signs. Ano yung unang natural signs? The first sign is a strong shaking. Dapat magkakaroon ng isang malakas na lindol. Next, pwedeng magkaroon ng biglang pagtaas or biglang pagbaba ng tubig sa Manila Bay. So yun yung next sign. Biglang aatras yung tubig and the third sign merong rumbling sound. Pero tatanda natin if you are in a coastal area, kung nandun kayo mismo sa coastal area, kailangan at the first instance na merong natural um, natural signs, kailangan nating mag-evacuate. So paano nyo malalaman kung gaano yung itatakbo or gaano yung magkakaroon ng tsunami doon sa lugar ninyo, you check the Hazard Hunter PH. Sa Hazard Hunter PH, marami nang nakalagay ng mga hazard maps for tsunami and this can be used para sa inyong planning, para sa inyong um, uh, evacuation plans. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Jeff. So, uh, dahil po limited tayo sa time, we will only entertain two more questions. But yung iba naman pong mga questions sa chat box ay sinasagot na po personally ni Yusek Solido. So, he's helping us address po yung mga questions, Sir Jeff. So, one question po, Sir Jeff, is about blind fault. Could blind fault, um, how are blind faults being mapped in our country? And ano nga po ba talaga itong blind fault na ating tinatawag? Okay. Um, may mga faults na uh, siyempre magsisimula siya sa ilalim ng lupa and some of these faults hindi siya nagpe-penetrate on the surface. Pag hindi siya nagpe-penetrate sa surface, we cannot see any tectonic or we cannot see any landforms na magde-distinguish kung nasaan yung uh, yung fault na yon. So what FIVOX is doing is that we we identify or we we we, we study the the seismicity of that area. We could also use mga geophysical um instruments. We can do refraction survey para ma-identify natin yung location ng mga faults. It will it needs mga geophysical instruments to identify these blind faults. Thank you. Thank you Sir Jeff and for our last question um na sasagutin po natin live. So yung iba pong hindi natin ma-adjust dito sa ating open forum ay sinasagot na po ni Yusek Solidum privately sa chat and we can also adjust them po later. We will send you po yung um, answers through your email kasama po na inyong e-certificate. So make sure po na naka-attendance po tayo. So Sir Jeff, since um, hindi po natin nasasabi kung kailan magkakaroon ng earthquake, how are we warning people about Earthquake and do we have alerting system? Okay, yun nga. Uh, first, well, hindi naman natin alam kung kailan magkakaroon ng lindol. But we all know na mangyayari talaga siya because of our location, yung ating tectonic setting, and we all know there are faults and trenches around the Philippines. So yung, yung idea na to, nagpo-produce din tayo or pinapakita natin yung iba't ibang earthquake scenario sa, sa isang lugar, ang mahalaga dito is the preparedness. Kailangan mag-prepare ang bawat pamilya, bawat individual about these big ones in your area. Um, yung ating information, uh, makikita nyo kaagad yung aming earthquake information kapag kayo ay aming mga Facebook followers, Twitter followers. We, you can immediately get the information. You can also visit our website. Ang aming objective ay kailangang makapag-produce kami or makapag-generate kami ng earthquake information within 13 minutes after the event. And nagagawa naman yan ng Facebook. So to get Immediately, the information, you go to our website, follow us sa aming Facebook and Twitter account. Bukas, sasabihin ni, ni Hans na meron kaming tool na mag alarm kapag nagkakaroon ng dindol sa lugar ninyo. So, abangan niya yan bukas. Okay po. Thank you, Sir Jeff. And baka po pero kasing na mag-curious, bakit 13 minutes ang tagal naman po? Okay. So, kailangan Sir Jeff? Nating, ano, kailangan nating mag-gather muna yung mga information gaming from the from the uh, mga seismic stations natin na strategically located all over the Philippines. Uh, kailangan nating i-check yung information na yun. We, got, we gather the, the, the tsunami, the, the intensity information. Yung 13 minutes, ano yan eh. So far ngayon, mas mabilis na yung nagagawa natin. 
Thank you, Sir Jeff. So, yan po, uh, we make sure po kasi na yung nilalabas naming information ay accurate as much as possible para hindi po tayo nagbibigay ng mga uh, information na hindi naman po kami sigurado. So, we make sure na tama po ang nilalabas na information. It is accurate. And um, we also want to encourage everyone kung kayo po ay nakaranas ng earthquake, Maganda po na i-report ito sa aming opisina, yung mga intensity report kasi minsan nakakatanggap kami ng inquiry sa Facebook na wala yung kanilang lugar or barangay doon sa aming earthquake information. So that is because we do not po have a reported intensity doon. So kung makaramdam po kayo ng earthquake, kung yan po mga nararamdaman ninyo, huwag nyo po yung tinatago. Itawag nyo po sa aming opisina yung intensity na inyong naramdaman para mailagay po namin sa aming earthquake information. And of course, I would like to thank Sir Jeff and of course, you Sex Solidum for joining us today sa ating FIVOX Talk Series, Searching for the Big One, Understanding the Earthquake Scenarios of the Philippines. So before we end, I would like to remind our participants na kagaya nga na nabanggit ni Sir Jeff kanina, nabanggit yun na earthquake scenarios, yung mga dapat nating paghandaan. Bukas naman, ano po ba yung mga tools na maaring makatulong sa ating paghahanda? At yan ay i-discuss ni Mr. Hans Alejandria para po sa ating mga audience. Uh, ito pong practical tools on hazards assessment for individual and family preparedness. So lalo na po yung mga nagtatanong kanina, ano po ba yung fault sa lugar nila? Ano po ba yung mga magnitude na pwede nilang ma-experience? Masasagot po yan ng ating tools na ipepresent ni Mr. Hans. Of course, let us not forget po na sagutan yung ating evaluation form. This is to help us improve yung paggawa po namin ng mga webinars and talks para po malaman natin ano po po ba yung mga pwede namin improve and what other topics would you like us to talk about. So the link will be provided by our secretariat or you can scan the QR code. And after nyo pong mag-evaluate na ating activity, gusto ko rin po kayong hikayatin na i-evaluate naman po yung ating programa sa DOST NSTW. So, andyan po yung ating link. At ang maganda po dito, pag kayo po ay nag-evaluate, meron po kayong chance na manalo ng 500 pesos. So, the raffle draw will be later at 5 p.m. and later at 5.30 announce yung winner. So, nag-evaluate ka na, pwede ka pang manalo ng 500 pesos. So, natuto na, kumita pa. And with that po, I would like to thank all our participants for joining us today and would like to invite you to join us again tomorrow. This has been FIVOX Talk Series. Thank you very much and have a nice day.